I'm here with Alan B. Chinen calling in from San Francisco. Alan, welcome to the podcast. And again, thanks so much for meeting with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I'd like to offer just a little background uh, for the people listening, but maybe also for yourself. What led me to your work? So uh, over the past couple of years, I've been thinking a lot about why middle-aged men in the West, in North America particularly, are in so much trouble. Currently, middle-aged men have the highest suicide rate of any demographic. Um, obviously, a lot of addiction and depression. And I started to wonder about why, what's missing in their lives. Um, they're supposed to be the demographic that's at the top of the world. And yet the, the figures around um, diseases of despair contradict that idea. And what I was coming to was the idea that middle-aged men don't have good stories to help uh, guide them through that middle-aged passage. And so they have a lack of meaning and purpose in their lives. And I was talking to someone who had me on their podcast, um, another guy who does men's work. And I was talking about this and what I'd been thinking about and thinking about uh, the archetypes that might be really helpful for middle-aged men to connect to. And so I was thinking about the, the wild man, that didn't feel quite right. That felt like maybe part of it is a reclamation of our wild nature. Uh, so thinking what happens when the wild man evolves, maybe he turns into a kind of mentor like Merlin uh, mm -hmm. or uh, Chiron, the, the Greek centaur. And I could see how that could give men a sense of meaning and purpose in life. Uh, and then after our call, he said, well, have you heard about Alan Chinen's work? He wrote a book called Beyond the Hero, and it talks all about what you're um, investigating right now. And I had never heard of your work before. And of course, when I found it, yes, decades ago, you um, you started to work on this, this uh, project. And uh, it's been wonderful getting into your work. And so that's what brings me to you. And I'm really happy that uh, you took me up on the offer to talk because I'd like more people to know about this work. So I'd like to focus on your book, Beyond the Hero, Classic Stories of Men in Search of Soul. Yes. But before we get into uh, some of the subject matter, I'm really curious to how you came to get interested in this project. I was tricked into it. But we're going to talk about the trickster. <laughs> he visited me early on. Uh, well, in medical school, I started to meditate to deal with the stress. And then I began to have vivid images, which I realized were the endings to fairy tales. So I sat down and wrote them out. And they all had adult protagonists, not the typical uh, children or youth, you know, like Cinderella, Snow White. So I thought, oh, I'm so smart. I invented something new. So I should get it published. Well, to our publishers later, uh, oh, well, I've got to change my plan. <laughs> they thought, well, there must be other stories about adults in folk tales. So I started looking for them and, oh my gosh, there are the jewels. Mine were like, you know, uh, cubic zirconia compared to the diamonds that folk tales were. So I just started studying them, noticing the uh, same themes from different cultures and it repeated over and over. And one of them was moving beyond the hero. Hmm. Yeah, well, in the introduction to your book, you talk about uh coming across Robert Bly's work and the men's movement, the whole mythopoetic movement back yes. in the late 80s and early 90s. Did you actually go to any of those conferences back then? Yes, I did go to one in Mendocino. Mm -hmm. How was that experience? Oh, it was quite moving for me, uh, seeing the solidarity of men. Um, it was also an introduction to climate change because it was really hot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting the coast to be so hot. Mm -hmm. And did you find what you were looking for in terms of uh, stories about middle-aged men? Um, not at the conference, but in all the folk tales I read. I guess I read through like 10,000 folk tales and picked out the ones that were about middle-aged or older men and focused on those. And they have uh, similar themes across cultures, which appear over and over again. So I figured they must be onto something. 
Mm. Uh, today, I guess you'd call it crowdsourcing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other people pick up the ideas and tell a story, and then the good ones are preserved and retained. Mm -hmm. Why do you think these stories haven't gotten as much play as stories about the hero's journey? Uh, um, well, I think the hero is much more socially acceptable. Uh, in Western culture, the trickster, who, as we we'll probably talk about, uh, comes after the hero, uh, is associated with Satan. And that's actually an aberration of culturally. Uh, most indigenous cultures have the trickster as the secondhand man for the creator. Uh, and the creator sends him to clean the world of monsters, to make the world safe for humanity. And of course, this trickster forgets his mission and then lies, cheats, plays around until he remembers, oh, I had a mission, and starts it up again. It's a very forgiving viewpoint, but there is a sacred mission. Hmm. So you feel, yeah, the hero is much more accepted in our culture. Um, what does the hero's journey lack that a middle-aged man needs? Oh, uh, it is one phase, uh, which probably most people have to complete to some degree. Uh, but of course, a hero, a hero achievement may not be becoming a billionaire or discovering computer cancer. Uh, but it is a phase, and it's succeeded by another one where you kind of give up all these quests, uh, a focus on victory and success, and focus on solving problems at hand. Oh, mm -hmm. and also generativity, giving to the less fortunate. I was struck by one theme. Uh, stories about middle-aged men show, show them learning how to lie and cheat and steal. But there's one firm rule I found. If you steal from those who are worse off than you, you're going to get killed. Uh, so it's a Robin Hood story. You can steal from those better off if you give it to the poor. Mm -hmm. Certainly absent in the hero culture, which we live in now. <clears throat> yeah. So one of the things I found interesting that um, I hadn't seen anyone make this move before was putting the hero and the patriarch together as uh, two aspects of the same archetype. Can you speak a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Uh, after the, in fairy tales, the hero you know, defeats the enemy, the villain, the dragon, and then becomes a new king. So the hero naturally becomes a patriarch. Uh, of course, there is a usual fight between the patriarch and the hero, which the hero has to overthrow the old patriarch. And so uh, the paradigm that the trickster uh, represents comes from an older tradition, which is a shamanic tradition. The hero tradition is basically the warrior tradition, which comes from uh, urban culture or it comes after agriculture. Uh, hunter-gatherers have the shamanic tradition, which is much more egalitarian. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things you talk about is, well, it's the, the way you put it is, uh, it's a three-part archetype, the hunter, shaman, trickster, and in contrast to the hero patriarch. Uh, and the uh, female who is subservient to both. Mm. in the hero mm. picture right um and so why uh well i can i can understand if we're putting the hero and the patriarch together that makes sense why that's kind of the guiding archetype or uh story in our culture um because it's very much a patriarchal culture uh, it's a culture focused on individual success or victory. The, the heroic pattern, you go after something and you get it, whether it's true love or a billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so one of the ideas you're putting forward is that uh, there needs to be something called a post-heroic journey. Yes, I think that's uh, quite important. Um, many indigenous cultures recognize that, and they have initiations for mature men, not just adolescents, uh, and they enter a different lodge, which is often uh, tricksterish. Mm -hmm. In what way? Uh, well, instead of being wise and just 
attending to serious business. It's often uh, a playful time where they play tricks on each other. Uh, somewhat like the Bohemian Grove in Mendocino. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so in the uh, the older man's lodge, might be a lot of joking around, ribbing each other, maybe uh, gossiping, that kind of thing. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, but also in the stories, the folk tales, not necessarily in real life now, there's uh, giving to the next generation, teaching them, transferring important skills and uh, resources. Oh, I have a little error message saying the internet connection is unstable. Uh, I hope hmm. you don't have a power outage. Yeah. It it's getting a little uh, interrupted, but it's not um, it's not overly distracting. So I know okay. we both uh, <clears throat> we've both got windstorms going on right now. Right. So we'll see if uh, the connection holds up for us. So I, I guess I wasn't too far off in um, suspecting that there's something about the archetype of the mentor that is really important in a man's midlife. Yes, um, that's. Uh crucial is the transition from the hero uh, because the hero has to have a training. Someone has to teach them stuff. If you think of King Arthur forming the round table, all knights had someone train them and sponsor them. Uh, and so they're supposed to do it to somebody else. Um, any professional practice depends upon that transmission. It's actually a uniquely human feature too, to teach someone who's not your blood relative. Is mm. animals will teach their offspring, but not others' offspring. Hmm. And maybe uniquely human too that we tend to uh, be more receptive to mentoring from uh, men outside of the the nuclear family. You know, the oh, uncles yes. or the the friends of the father, whoever. It seems yes. to come e easier if uh, there's that um, more more of a distance in the relationship. Yeah, it takes away the father son rivalry that yeah something through. something else you talk about quite a bit because uh, that's the main concern of the hero in lots of stories uh, but the beyond the hero that sort of disappears mm -hmm. it's more um, the teacher and this uh, mentor and mentee mm -hmm. usually it's not related yeah and so you're seeing the the mentor as a as a kind of stage after the the hero and that makes sense the hero's journey i mean in contemporary culture is very much about um like what jung thought was the tasks of the first half of life like going out yes. into the world uh having success finding mastery in some aspect of your life uh and so it just makes sense that at a certain point, uh, as your energy maybe starts to diminish or something, that you would turn into just passing on some of that the skills and knowledge that you've acquired in the first half of your life. Yes, and playing fun games. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Often, often playing pranks on younger people, uh, but as part of their training. That that's funny. I found um, a little uh, plastic cockroach the other day, and I picked it up and put it in my pocket because I thought it would be great to. I, I give less music lessons to one of my young oh, nephews, oh. and I thought next time I go see him, I'm gonna like pull this out and put it on his uh, guitar amp or something <laughs> and give him a scare. So that seems like oh. a natural thing for us uncles or mentors to do is play pranks. Yes, yes. Uh, but not. Um ranks that actually harm the younger person. Mm -hmm. what, what's the function of that? You know, playing uh, older man, playing pranks on a, a younger man. What's that all about? Oh, that's a good question. It's actually found in a lot of different cultures. The, the joking relationship, often with an uncle, never with the father. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's a non-serious male connection. Hmm. So there's something about that uh, non-serious aspect of that relationship that uh, enables what maybe closer bonding. Uh, I think so. Um, it kind of decompresses the thing. It's not focused on just winning 
the next tournament. Mm -hmm. So kind of an easier relationship can can flourish if yes. uh, if there's joking and and yeah. Hmm, that's really nice. You know, I like to hear that that uh, yeah. mentoring actually shouldn't be so kind of rigid and serious. Like one of the things that came out of the men's movement is um, uh, a whole lot of men wanting to mentor young men at at risk youth and things like that. Uh, but what I've found is that those situations seem to be like actually quite serious and and quite structured. Like you go away for a weekend, maybe it's in the wilderness, and there's a set of kind of tasks that you go through, and there's a very kind of solemn. Uh, attitude around the whole thing and it's just never appealed to me and i always yeah. just thought well it's because i have too much trickster in me it's just it's too earnest <laughs> for my taste uh -huh. uh, and it's a little earlier than uh, being transitioning to the trickster role yourself the, the mentor is sort of like the prelude to that hmm so i um hmm What's the, uh, so then uh, transitioning from mentor to trickster, like, is that is that actually a realistic idea for modern men who are often expected to work into their 60s and 70s? Um, I think it is. Uh, one problem with sort of the men's uh, trajectory or the social socially expected career is you keep getting more and more wealthy and powerful. Uh, it's kind of like gravity. Uh, once you start getting some mass, you keep wanting more and more, <laughs> you keep start sucking everything in. Uh, so the trickster introduces humor as the counterweight that you don't need to achieve more. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to pass it on to uh, teach the next generation and that often takes humor mm -hmm. yeah i'm just negotiating there's like a little kind of interruption happening um yeah. the dreaded buffering yeah let's just see if it clears up in a moment oh now you've completely frozen Well, PG E Pacific Gas and Electric is famous for kind of unreliable connections. So, you know, if power goes out somewhere where a server is, we get disconnected. You're in San Francisco. I mean, this is the technology hub of uh, North America. You should have the greatest connection in the world. You would think so, but uh, <laughs> fiber optics only came recently to San Francisco because there's so much old stuff underground that they have to dig up. To put new stuff in. Actually, the most connected country, the fastest connections is South Korea. Hmm. Because they have all the new stuff they built. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about um, is like, so you focus mostly on uh, fairy tales and folk tales. Yes. So what do, what do fairy tales and folk tales have to offer that the big myths don't? Oh, a very important thing. Uh, they can go against the established orthodoxy. Uh, lots of fairy tales and folk tales make fun of the established religion, and they bring up subversive ideas. Uh, they often portray women as heroes, regaining their power, and make fun of the king and patriarch. Uh, so it's something that's outside the main, uh, well, outside the orthodox mainstream. And you always say, because if someone says, what are you talking about? Oh, it's just a fairy tale. Why are you getting so upset? Hmm. <laughs> oh, I suppose that's a trickster move too. Right. So that, yeah. So I guess, could it, would it be fair to say that myths tend to uphold the status quo of the, the dominant culture and that um, fairy tales and folk tales uh, subvert the status quo? Yes, as a generalization, I think that's 
True. Uh, also, many of the storytellers were women rather than men. So they weren't, you know, following the dogma. Hmm. In fact, the Grimm's uh, brothers who collected so many fairy tales, uh, their informants were uh, their childhood nursemaids or one, nannies uh, who told them their stories. So they came from three women. Interesting. Yeah, I thought that was I don't know if they got credited in the foreword to those books. Uh, nope. Uh, <laughs> shocking. <laughs> Were you able in in reading all of those uh, fairy tales and folk tales, like you said, probably something like ten thousand, which is mind blowing? Did you come across any stories about uh, gay men? Oh no, uh, they're not explicit. Uh, they're more that would be more common in some mythologies, you know, like Zeus running around with everybody. Uh, and also indigenous cultures where they had the um, the shaman role was often taken by the what they call the two spirit person who didn't follow the usual gender rules. Hmm. I, I ask because um, I, I kind of uh, I suspect that that the trickster role is often um, carried by gay men in our culture. Uh, because they're kind of already outside of the 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 typical trajectory for w what a man's life should look like and all of that. And so I found that um, gay men especially seem to retain a lot of like the playfulness and adventurousness into middle age that uh, I don't see as common in heterosexual men. Uh, I think you're right, and actually, it's a major part of Native American tradition. Is the contrary, or the Heoka, or the twin spirit, who do not fit into the standard gender roles, uh, and their act, their job is actually to make people think, as one person, one tricks to put it, uh, breaking the conventions to get people to think. Hmm. Think outside the box. Yes, exactly. Yeah. One of the tales that uh, has been put, been put forward by a number of people, um, psychologist Robert Johnson, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the, the mystic, is uh, the Parsifal myth around the Holy Grail. They see that as a real guiding uh, story for, for men. Now, I always felt like it left us hanging at a certain point, right? Like yes. it, it leaves it leaves us with a great question, actually. Like for who, like whom does the Grail serve? So it's that transition from the heroic conquest into service, but um, that's where the story ends, and so we don't get the tale of how Parsifal then um, lived out that question, as yes. Roka might put it, right? Yes. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about Parsifal and how that relates to the hero's journey and how it kind of leaves us hanging? Um, I think it was uh, because they didn't have a clear view of the next stage after the hero. Uh, because um, Parsifal pretty much follows standard Christian tradition where, well, they made up the Holy Grail story, but it's a holy quest. And of course, you have to be serious and pure and everything to enter the holy sanctum. Uh, so that's where the trickster was eliminated. Uh, the trickster basically is Satan uh, in Christian tradition. Although early uh, Christianity was much more liberal, and I guess they had uh, the devil's mass in medieval uh, cathedrals where they would have a reverse mass. It was basically a parody. It wasn't a kind of a sorcery thing. It was to make fun of the hierarchy until, of course, after a century or so, the church said, no more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there's that transition period where a lot of the, the pagan elements were still tolerated because if they weren't, people would never uh, accept Christianity yes. outright. And, and we see that in Latin America, too, yes. where a lot of those... Um, the, the kind of uh, indigenous aspects are still at play and maybe it's been syncretized with some, with some saints, but it's a, it's a thin, thinly veiled paganism that's still alive, even in those uh, Latin American uh, Catholic places. Yes. Right. Uh, and there would be like folk celebrations, right. Where the uh, indigenous trickster type figures come out. 
as opposed to like you know the religious processions, the standard ones, where you have saints but not tricksters. Although uh, one of my favorite stories is a German tale of Brother Lustig, where he basically is taught how to become a trickster by Saint Peter himself. Well, that's kind of a trickster move is to have <laughs> yes. Saint Peter be the one who initiates him into exactly. a trickster, yes. right? Well, yeah. Well, Saint Peter keeps up his role as the uh, um, moral principal, even while he's teaching the soldier to become a trickster. Well, that just seems like psychologically healthy uh, to have it out in the open, right? To mm -hmm. have it acknowledged yes. that look, there's got to be a, a, a pure Saint Peter, but if we're going to have that, he's got to have his like shadow aspect somewhere, and we got to make room for him. Of course, his shadow aspect's pretty clear in the Gospels, where uh, you know he denies Christ, uh, he jumps on, over the boat to walk on water like Jesus. He's kind of a fool in many cases, but he's become the rock. Saint Peter. Saint Peter, yes. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's it's certainly something that's kind of been lost over the years. Yes. Um, there's aspects of of uh, the stories of Jesus where there's like a little bit of a trickster element yes. there, like when he curses the fig tree. Like that to me just seems like an inexplicable little tale to to throw in the Gospels because it doesn't cast Jesus in a in a good light. It's like they're out on this long walk. They come to a fig tree. They want to eat, but there's no figs. It's not bearing fruit. So Jesus curses the fig tree to never bear fruit again. Uh -huh. And I always thought, like, I, I kind of point that out to people sometimes in a joking way. Like, even Jesus got hangry. You know, when you're hungry and you get angry and, and crotchety. Yes. Uh, like, even Jesus got hangry. <laughs> That's a good one. So don't worry if you get a little bit edgy, too, when you haven't eaten. Um, but otherwise... <laughs> you know what's what lesson is that <laughs> yes, yes teaching people you know uh it's okay to be human i i think so but <laughs> it's not really held up as a story like yeah. like that you know yeah. <laughs> we only get the kind of the, the purity stories about jesus and he's like the model of the the perfect human in a yes. way yes well, but behind him is something else the, yeah the yeah right well, oh. uh, Christian doctrine is interesting. There's a father, the son, the patriarch, and the hero. And then what is the Holy Ghost? It's yeah. A trickster. It's a trickster. Yes. Nobody could figure out what the Holy Ghost is or does. Right. Yeah, it's got that hermetic aspect to it. Like, it's really slippery. You can't define yes. it. You can't put your finger on it. Uh -huh. Nobody can give you a good explanation. Well, it's the intermediary between <laughs> us and God. Well, that's kind of like Hermes too, right? The yes. messenger and yes. the psychopomp. Yes. And that's a major function of the trickster uh, and the shaman. I had never thought about the Holy Spirit as the trickster element in Christianity, but uh, I'm liking I'm liking the <laughs> hypothesis here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, interesting. Well, that that kind of relates to um, one of the the main themes that you're working with in the book is the the figure of the spirit brother. Oh yes. Can can you talk a little bit about that figure? Oh, um, when often a protagonist at, for men at midlife is a soldier who's been discharged from the army with nothing, uh, which is kind of what's going on. In the, society today where the middle class and men at midlife and the diseases of despair. And in that period, a mysterious figure appears. It might be a, a spirit or a real person, but someone who takes the man under his wing, so to speak, and in tricky ways teaches him the next phase, which is the trickster phase, is how to um, hand out the goodies instead of keeping collecting them himself. The, the trickster also is the culture bringer usually for uh, cultures with mythologies. The trickster brings language, agriculture, healing, uh, the crucial gifts that mankind, humankind needs. Mm, technology. A technology. Like uh, Prometheus bringing fire. Yes, exactly. Uh, Hermes inventing the, the lyre. 
and he's seen as like the god of uh modern technology in a yes. way right computers and the internet are very hermes yes mm -hmm. uh, except that got taken over <laughs> by the hero who you know large corporations took over right these heroic figures like elon musk and uh jeff bezos yes who are trying to do their uh icarus flights to to mars and the moon and wherever yeah it's haven't they read these stories these guys don't they know how <laughs> dangerous it is to shoot for the stars yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course uh did you had an exemplary life you get put up in the heavens even in the greek mythology right mm -hmm. yeah unless you choose to live half your life in the underworld like persephone you know yes uh she didn't quite choose <laughs> we well, there's, a, there, there's a lot of people who are rereading that myth and um and saying that uh she actually that the whole idea that she was um, abducted and raped by <laughs> Hades is is actually a misread and that she actually wanted, because that was almost more uh, subversive for her to actually want to spend time in the underworld. Yes. Yeah. Um, especially as the wife of her uncle. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of that going on yes, in the Greek in myths, Greek right? <laughs> uh, the other reading is, well, at least the one that came up, um, like is Demeter blackmailed the gods, including Zeus, into having her return after the year. Because mm. Demeter let nothing grow, right? And the gods would disappear without sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So there's that trickster element, again, coming around to uh, bring balance in the world. Yes, yes. Mm. Can you, Do you have an example offhand of the spirit brother? Oh, and, and uh, maybe even like using a contemporary uh, film example or something, like oh, whatever whatever comes to mind. Uh, well, I live in the old days, <laughs> so uh, the contemporary example. So it's some kind of like magical being that shows up to help guide the hero into the next stage. Um, it's not the mentor necessarily. He's no. because there's a different relationship there. Yes, uh, Native American tradition would be the spirit guide. Uh, of course, they usually appear for the initial initiation, um, but the fairy tales indicate that they become a bigger role at mature uh, when men become mid middle aged, and the hero's path kind of peters out. Uh, mm. What would be a good example? Yeah, it's just because like a lot of the tales that you put in the book are are obscure to most people. Yes. And so if we talk about the frog in Fidot's tale, people aren't going to understand that until they read the book or or read the tale, right? Uh, I was just wondering if there was one that um, people might recognize in another story. But maybe because it's so hard to draw out, it, it's a, it's a, a kind of uh, affirmation that these stories about men in middle age and mentorship and, and coming into the trickster just have been suppressed or lost because of the dominance of the patriarchal heroic culture. Um, the other half of that is the folk tales have lots of stories about women who go out and rescue someone or the whole culture or society, uh, completely reversed of the usual fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Or the myths. Well, one of the things, like in the in the Fidot's tale, this Russian tale, uh, all of the 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 people who help Fidot along the way are all uh, feminine. You know, whether it's the the little frog or his wife, who's got some access to magical helpers, and um, so that's kind of interesting. So there's something about the role of women in helping men through this uh, midlife passage? Yes. Um, that fits the usual Jungian view that men have to deal with the anima first uh, before they come to the self. Uh, and in uh, Fedat's tale, the ultimate spirit brother is clearly male. It's a spirit that is male. Uh, although he's called, uh, his name is actually piece of rag or piece of cloth. 
the smart a, a, a rag of reason, smart reason. Uh, so it's really quite odd. And of course, uh, in the story was mentioned about Brother Lester, it's St. Peter himself who is the spirit brother. Um, and he does an accomplish, he accomplishes an amazing task. He teaches <laughs> uh, Brother Lustig to be a trickster while continuing to be the saint, the paragon mm. of virtue. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in, um, in an actual man's life, what, uh, what kind of person would fill that role? Like in the men that you've worked with as a clinician, have you seen uh, middle-aged men encounter someone that you might consider a spirit brother that helps them, uh, you know, evolve wow. into this kind of playful trickster mentor type? Yes, it's a little less common in modern society, I think, uh, than in more traditional ones. And sometimes it's a real spiritual brother or a dream. Uh, well, like for Jung, it was Philemon the inner image that came up to him and he said taught him everything. Uh, and there was another case that uh, I worked with in therapy who just heard a voice tell him, uh, start telling stories. So he gave up his business career. Hmm. Hmm. Well, and, it takes it takes a lot of faith to listen to a, a figure that comes to you in a dream and tells you to like, change exactly, your career. Exactly, yes. How do you make out with that? Uh, he was really happy. <laughs> Poor but happy? <laughs> uh, well, he had made enough so he could survive without being a businessman, which is probably the, the role of the hero phase. Yeah, well, it, it kind of aligns with what you're talking about earlier, that um, part of the trickster aspect is not caring about material wealth. And so I can imagine, you know, and I've gone through this myself at middle age, having the crisis, you know, having had a successful career, finding out that the ladder I was climbing was against the wrong wall the whole time, but <laughs> took me a number of years of climbing to realize that. And then um, starting to listen to the urgings of my own soul and do work that was more meaningful to me, yes. um, hasn't been as financially uh, rewarding but has made me feel rich in so many other ways that it just doesn't seem uh, to be an option to to choose financial success over what I what I currently get from my work. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, have you tried stealing from the rich? <laughs> that's that's the uh, message from the folk tales. Although what you steal, you have to give to the poor, so you can't keep it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the nice things about having wealthy clients is that they can come more often and yes. pay a little more. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll keep that in mind in terms of uh, future business plans. <laughs> uh, in the story about uh, Lustig, uh, St. Peter keeps doing miracles with Lustig around helping people and then saying, oh, we don't need a reward even after it resurrects a dead person. But of course, the soldier said, what are you talking about? We need something. We have to eat. Mm -hmm. So they get stuff because he keeps hinting around. But Peter says, we don't need anything. And of course, it's true. He doesn't eat, right? <laughs> He's just spirit. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well enough for you, St. Peter, yeah, but I got to well. fill my belly here. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't, um, yeah, subsist on pure light. Um, <laughs> Well, this is good. I wonder, can we just take a little break? Uh, the connection, I think, improved. Whatever happened was in our favor. I think Hermes came in and yes, uh, yes. fixed things. Uh -huh. Okay, so we were um, talking about the, the Parsifal myth and how that really only uh, guides us up to maybe middle age. Like, it's very much a heroic journey. Yes. Now, the post-heroic journey that you uh, point to in the book is a, a Russian tale about Fedot. Yes. And it's far too complex for us to just give a, a brief summary. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the characteristics of these tales about middle-aged men that you say that they're actually quite complex. Yes. And they go on and on and on. 
Why, why do you think that is? Uh, they go on and on and on, but they usually have only two characters, the uh, main protagonist and then this teacher figure, and, which is typical. Uh, women have much more friends and uh, people they can confide in. Men usually don't, and the stories reflect that. Mm-hmm. But why do you think that they go on and on and on? Because uh, in my experience, men tend to be not the most verbose communicators, you know? So like, uh, I can imagine a man thinking like, well, just cut to the chase. Like, what's the moral of the story here? Yes. You know, like, this is a rambling tale. Like, come on, cut to it. Uh, except each little, what seems like a silly little adventure actually has deep symbolic meaning. Um the cut to the chase thing is the hero's attitude, right? Yeah. So maybe even in the way that the struck the, the tales are structured with all the complexity and um, you know, uh adventures within the bigger adventure and all that is in a way helping a man settle into a different mode of uh being to just like kind of relax, allow for rambling, um, not be so uh quick to get to the point and all of that kind of thing. So it seems like even the structure of the tale is helping to transform the man in a way. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, the process of the story is part of the instruction. Yeah. Uh, it's also kind of like how Zen teachings go on. They, they kind of, the teaching is mysterious and tricksterish. Mm -hmm. and you assume there's a meaning behind it but who knows if there is yeah right you just kind of have to uh immerse yourself in it and see what sticks is the way yes. I, I think about it usually it's like i don't worry about uh getting all of the symbolism and the lessons um because that's just going to kind of frustrate the storytelling part of it. But I just try to like let let it kind of wash over me in a way and then see what sticks at the end. Yes. That might be the meaningful part for me. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's really interesting. Just the the mode of storytelling is part of the instruction. Like man has to learn to sit down and relax and just let the maybe the older man or woman tell this rambling story that doesn't <laughs> seem to have a clear point <laughs> or and that man's journey seems like a rambling journey that has no point but actually it has a point what's the point uh transitioning from the hero to the shaman but uh, it's a long journey uh-huh yeah so how how does um how do you see the trickster and the shaman related i mean uh shaman can often be uh culture keepers for the society but they're usually involved in some sort of healing or or divination work yes uh well uh the way i kind of simplify it is the shaman is a human version of the trickster who's actually a god or an immortal uh, so the trickster can do stuff for that we couldn't do as uh, humans but the shaman does it or tries to. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But the shame is also the connection with the other world. Mm -hmm. Well, generally, um, any given community might have, what, one or two shaman. So not every man is meant to become a shaman. Hmm. Uh, no. Uh, again, I always go back to Native American tradition. It's a calling and a lot of people, men and women, who get the calling to be the shaman or the contrary, don't want it because it's rather difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're not saying uh, necessarily that in middle age, a men's task is to become a, a trickster shaman. Um, are there qualities of the shaman that maybe every man should think about exploring? Uh, I think that's a good point. The, the goal is not to become a uh, trickster shaman in society or in real life, but to recognize the important aspects of it in our own lives and how important that is in everyday life. Mm. But as a specialty, uh, but we already have, um, I guess, comedians, actors would be 
some of the shame and trickster type. Mm. Well, one of the ways I could see that translating into contemporary Western culture is um, service to the community would be one aspect of the shaman figure, right? Yes. Um, subverting the the status quo. So in modern terms or contemporary terms, that might mean a man who uh, goes to city council meetings and, and speaks out against uh injustice or rigidity or or whatever it is right yes um but in a funny way we more like the white house roasts ah but, yeah yeah of course most of the comedians who go there aren't middle-aged yet i mean mm -hmm. they, they pursued their career as a hero journey yeah yeah, and it seems more acceptable in our culture for younger men to embody the the trickster energy. But at a certain point, you gotta uh, you gotta get straight. You gotta smarten up. You gotta get serious about life, right? Yes. Uh, and the one who doesn't do that becomes a, <laughs> the Trump trickster, where they do tricks, but it's only for their benefit. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the crucial difference. The trickster. Uh, in stories, uh, does have a mission from the creator to help humanity to put things back in balance. Yes, sometimes exactly. by by flipping things on their head, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the things in in the telling of uh, that complex tale of Fido <laughs> that we cannot summarize. Uh, <laughs> yes. But you draw out two tasks that you think every man must complete according to these stories. One is to disobey instructions from the mentors and teachers in order to break free from the heroic patriarchal thinking. And the other is to make contact with the trickster brother who we've talked about. That's trickster brother and spirit brother are the yes, same figure. Same yes. Yeah. What about this, this first task of disobeying instructions? Um, why is that so important? Um, well, it's actually from the Parsifal myth dramatizes it, where uh, Parsifal's mentor, Grunemann, told him, oh, you must not speak to your spoken to and follow all these rules. And it's only when he breaks that and asks the question in the Grail Castle that the next stage begins. Of course, we actually don't know what happens after that, unfortunately. Mm. But, but, sorry, well, what? Yeah, why is it important to disobey or disregard the instructions of the mentor? Is that in a way um, uh, finding yourself as as a man, like I that, think it, yes, like a kind of a break with the father type situation, but a break with the mentor teacher and and to yes. forge your own path, and a uh, break with society too, the traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the aspect. You know, when I was doing my uh, kind of initial thinking around this why I thought the wild man uh, was an important aspect of it, because the wild man um, is cast out or leaves society and lives uh, usually like just on the edge of, of uh, civilization, um, you know, far enough that he's not uh, conditioned too much by the society, but close enough that people can access him still. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is the role of the shaman. Yeah, exactly. The shaman's always in the hut, just on the edge of uh, the yes. village, right? Like yes. they they don't want him like right in the village because there's wild stuff going on over there. Yes, <laughs> and, and it uses suspicious senses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you keep him at arm's length. Um, well, that's interesting. So when you uh, put out these books, did you get more men, like middle aged men, coming to you as a psychiatrist? Like, did you see more men coming to you in your practice? Like, did that become a kind of specialty for you? Um, uh, more men came, yes. And it didn't really become a specialty. I, I was looking mainly at anybody at midlife. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a factor in getting clients, patients, mm -hmm. customers. <laughs> customers. Um in your experience, it, I found like men are maybe not as open as women in terms of doing um, 
you know, self-development or transformational work. Uh, and I think books like yours and the books that, you know, Robert Bly and Michael Mead and those guys have put out have opened men a little more to the idea of it, but uh, uh, they tend not to be clinical practitioners, right? Yes. So did, did, did you see a change in the clients who are coming to you or like, what are the ratios generally between men and women in your practice? Um, well, mostly women come for therapy. Men are much less common. Uh, although it became more equal after the book uh, Beyond the Hero and Once Upon a Midlife came out. Hmm. Did the men stick with it? Uh, most of them did, actually, yes. Okay, so even when you got through the initial stages uh, and it starts to get maybe challenging with um, you know, transference or really kind of digging into the, the core issues. You know, I found a lot of men can shy away at that point. You know, that's when they kind of, they disappear is when things start getting a little edgy and, and tough. Um, how have you found that in your practice? Um, the transference doesn't come up as often with men. Uh, as someone put it, I forget who it was, that, um, women tend to relate face to face men relate by shoulder to shoulder uh, mm -hmm. so that the discuss the relationship isn't so important or common but doing something together is yeah well that's what you know my working theory is around why uh, men aren't so attracted to face-to-face -face therapy is because it's so confrontational uh it may be better you know i think for some therapy to happen with men out on a walk where we're walking, like yes. you said, shoulder to shoulder and just having a talk, but it's not, um, takes away that kind of intensity, yes. the, the intimacy that can make so many men feel uncomfortable. Um, that's where the spirit teacher is helpful because he does the teaching along the walk or along their adventures. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. You know, it I just occurred to me that maybe a, a modern example of a, a spirit brother, spirit teacher is Obi-Wan Kenobi in the oh, Star yes. Wars uh -huh. movies. Yes. Uh -huh. Right? Because he's already passed on and he shows up as an apparition at the right time, just when Luke needs like a little encouragement or guidance. It's like, like Obi-Wan <laughs> shows up. Luke. Yes. <laughs> and Obi-Wan is past the hero warrior stage. Right. Yeah. And he does have that trickster element, like when yes. uh, they're trying to pass through the, the border and yes. he, he tricks the guard, he puts a spell on them and says, these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh. Okay. So Obi-Wan would be a good example of this spirit uh, brother or spirit teacher. Merlin is another, but he's, he was around author for much longer than from middle age. Yeah. And, yeah, I've thought about Merlin too as like a great uh great example of that from like the Western tradition. But it's really hard to find good stories that uh focus on Merlin in that aspect, you know? He's kind of can tend to be a peripheral character in a way. It kind of comes and goes, <laughs> like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah. Yeah. What about uh, Gandalf? Would you say he's oh, a kind yes. of trickster spirit brother figure? Yes, to a number of characters in the, the book and movies. Mm -hmm. Well, there's like the other mentors, like the, the kind of warrior mentors. Uh, but Gandalf, you know, he's so playful. He'll show up and blow smoke rings that turn into dragons and, and things like that, right? Um I always found him, yeah. And he we don't know where Gandalf lives. It's like he's like the the wild man in a way. Like he lives yes. probably out in the woods somewhere. We're not quite sure, but he just shows up. <laughs> yes. I suppose uh, Dumbledore is another figure like that because he's funny, tricksterish, and has a secret. Hmm. He has a secret to tell. Um well. We've covered uh, some good stuff here. I mean, anything yes. else do you think is kind of important? Uh, I guess like one of the things I'm curious about is like, 
how men can can uh, work with these stories. I mean, they can read your book and and read your kind of exposition of the the symbolism in the story, but I'm not sure that that's going to be enough to help in a man's transformation or initiate him into uh, this middle age uh, role. Um, any other things that you th you found helpful for men at this stage? Yes, one of the big uh, things that help would be uh, having a particular story like Fedat. Uh, where in the story are you now? Where are you stuck? Huh, okay. How did you get past that? Or if this were your life, when did this happen in your life? Right. Well, one example that comes to my mind uh, at a certain, like Fidot's, um, th there's a king who's trying to get Fidot's beautiful wife. Uh, and so he's trying to get rid of Fidot. So he gets his servant to um, to put forth these impossible tasks in front of Fidot. So if, if Fidot fails, which should be an inevitable because they're impossible tasks, then he, he's supposed to die. But uh, Fidot, his wife, is a kind of trickster figure who helps um, who helps him get around that. And uh, but the one that kind of get, he gets stuck on is this uh, this task that the king's well, Baba Yaga tells yes. the king, okay, this is how you get him. You send him out on a task to you don't know where for something, and he has to get something you don't know what it is. And there's no way you can you can answer that call. There's no way you can complete that task. Uh, and I could see like, you know, in a man's life at a certain point, you might get to a place where you're not even sure what the goal is, like where you're just completely at a loss. Right. Well, well a good example of that would be Odysseus. Uh, later in life, he set out on another voyage to he did not know where. Hmm. It was no longer a hero, a, you know, hero's journey, but pure exploration. And so, what's the key to succeeding uh, on on a task like that? <laughs> uh, uh, recognizing a spirit brother was a dream, a person, or it could be a uh, you know, philosophy, and following. Mm. So, looking more toward. Um... The spiritual realm for an answer, some guidance, rather than something in the material realm. Like, yes, here's how to succeed and win friends and influence people, and Tony Robbins and all that kind of stuff. But you're, if you're doing that, you're looking in the wrong place, and you'll never uh, succeed at the challenge in front of you. But look toward the spiritual. Um, Is that right? Yes, uh, but it's not necessarily spiritual in the traditional sense of religious morality uh because in some stories the spirit brother is the devil uh right. you know, but like you said looking to uh to dreams to maybe intuitions that you have looking even to your desires like what your true heart's desire is that kind of thing yes and i think uh also it helps to look at older cultures or indigenous cultures that haven't had all this structure built around it mm -hmm. yeah for like alternatives to um, the the kind of expectations that are laid out in front of us in this culture yes. it's like, look there's a there's another way to be a middle-aged man and it could be you know that that older guy with the twinkle in his eye telling uh telling jokes to the young boys or something right yes yeah teaching them how to fish and good things like that exactly yeah. But the crucial requirement being it's for their benefit, not his. Yeah, that was an interesting thing when I was talking to this guy who does men's work uh, and they do those kind of initiatory weekends and things like that. And I was talking about, you know, how I think, you know, I suspect that it's really important for middle-aged men to to get into the mentor archetype. And one of the things that this other gentleman um, said was that, well, the blessing goes both ways. And I said, the man can't go into mentorship expecting to get a blessing from the young person. It's too much of a burden. And I think it's just kind of a wrong idea. Uh, and you seem to be backing me up with that, that you can't go in it to 
get anything out of it for yourself. Like it's not about you getting a blessing or anything else. It's about you being in service to the community and passing on uh, the skills and knowledge that you've acquired and to do it in a, in a, I don't know, a fun loving yes. kind of way. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point that um, you do get blessings. That's not the point. It happens when you're doing something fun and you least expect it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it becomes like a there's a reward that comes into you, but it's not, um, you know, that young boy looking up at you and, you know, acknowledging you or affirming you or anything like that. It happens in the act of doing it. It's a kind of comes from somewhere else, maybe. Yes, might be teaching the young person something and then they really excel, but forget you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and they don't attribute their success to you. And like, yeah, you can't take that personally. You got to just yeah. be happy for them. Yes. Yeah. The, the trickster doesn't keep stuff for himself. Right. He steals and passes things around. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, I can see that, you know, even um, just uh, teaching like my my nephew music. It's like, I'm stealing from all the greats, you know, I can sit there and play and he, he may be in awe. Like I just came up with this stuff from nowhere, but I'm stealing from, you know, Jimi Hendrix or whoever. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, although it's there, but it's, there. It, it, but it's in, in the, um, it's in the interest of getting him interested and yes. excited about it. Right. Yes. Which is a little tricksterish. Yes. I never thought of it, but it's totally what's going on there. And get him hooked <laughs> on music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to trick him into getting interested because I know he'll get all these other benefits from it, you know. Well, oh, that's another aspect of the trickster is music. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how so? Like, I know, you know, Hermes, when he came out of the cave when he was a baby, one of the first things he did was invent the lyre out of a turtle shell. <laughs> but uh, yeah, tell me a bit more about that. What's the role of music in that, in the um, trickster? Well, with shamans, a lot of their uh, ritual does involve chanting, which is a basic form of singing and drumming. Um, uh, but music itself is very tricksterish. It's hard to define. You never know where you end up with it. And uh, especially recently, musicians have been outraged. Like you mentioned Jim Morrison. They were playing the shaman role. Yeah. And yeah, well, now you're outing yourself in your age because Jim Morrison was like 50 years ago now. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he appeared in a um, movie I saw recently. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. And they're often there to subvert the status quo in a lot yeah. of ways. Like I see that with a lot of... Um, new artists coming out playing with uh devilish imagery and, and getting all the conservatives upset and things <laughs> like that and the conspiracy theorists all wound up <laughs> but um, i think they're when, just having fun and, and they're doing something that they want to be shocking and you know, yes they want to get people's attention um which is part of the uh contrary's role the shaman's role but of course they have to remember that they do get attacked <laughs> And, there's right. a consequence yeah it's yes. dangerous that's why not everyone wants to be the shaman exactly yeah. not everyone wants to be the hayoka because it's like yeah you're gonna get some heat there's gonna be some blowback mm -hmm. and you may be cast out you may have to live on the edge of town and not be able to participate in everything right but people will come to you for help <laughs> That's right. And they'll tell you all their secrets, right? <laughs> That's right. That's um, why we love our job, don't we, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you think uh do you think every good therapist needs to have a lot of trickster in them? I think so, yeah. Uh at least a trickster spirit to think outside the box. Uh try to do some uh, figure out what to do for this person right now. Mm. And to take those imaginative leaps with the with the client, yes. right? Like if they bring a dream, you got to be able to go into that dream with them and have a look around and stuff, right? Oh, like Hermes, the psychopath. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that's true? Even because you're a you're a medical psychologist, uh, psychiatrist, right? Yes. Uh -huh. 
But it sounds like you've been influenced a lot by depth psychology. Like, how does that melt for you? Um, well, it, uh, it just seemed natural that they go together. Uh, it's like we're finding out a lot of the biochemistry of lots of stuff uh, going on mentally and probably spiritually. But that doesn't mean spiritual stuff is just biochemical. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know the, how the eye works, but that doesn't mean that what we see is just electrical disturbances. It, there's beauty and wonder. Yeah. The response to what the eye sees is has something to do with the soul. Yes. Yeah. Because the mechanics of the eye, it's like, well, yeah, so what? It's like, yeah, the heart is like a pump, but everybody knows the heart is a lot more than just a, a pump. Yes. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean, it just doesn't seem to be too common uh, that I hear from psychiatrists who also are actually, you know, they're, they're psychiatrists, they're soul doctors, or they're supposed to be, but you don't often hear psychiatrists talk about the soul. Um, yes, it's not socially acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to talk about uh, diagnoses and uh, peer-reviewed studies and things like that, right? Yes. Yes. Things you things you can pin down and put a finger on and define, put in a box and the DSM and all of that. And the soul, the soul's not in the DSM anywhere, not that I could find. <laughs> or, or morality. Well, or yeah. Yeah. Well, Alan, um, it's from one trickster to another, it's really fun talking with you. Yes, and I enjoyed this. I'm so That's happy. Right. I'm so happy to discover your work because now I won't have to write the book. <laughs> you don't have to read 10,000 fairy tales. <laughs> yeah, you've done the the heavy lifting for us. And now I can just recommend middle-aged guys read your book, um, Beyond the Hero. Uh, it's wonderful. And, you know, um, the mythologist and writer Sharon Blackie uh, has, has brought up the post-heroic journey, too. It's something she's come to. But she said that uh, because she uh, she works mostly with women, she said the task uh, of finding myths for men's middle age is up to, to up, up to men. And so I don't know if she's familiar with your work, but I'm going to let her know that uh, this work has been done, or at least someone started it. And I just I don't think that your work has gotten enough attention probably because of the intense focus and reverence for the hero and the flashy hero and all of that. Um, so I'm going to do my part in uh, helping to get your work out there because I think it's it's really important. And men, middle-aged men are in a crisis right now. That's yes. undeniable. The numbers don't lie. Uh, and so something needs to be done. And I think a guiding, uh, kind of inspiring, life-giving story is part of the the medicine that middle-aged men yes. need yes um one of the problems that beset society now which is why so many middle-aged men are adrift and despair and the older people won't give up the hero king role that's an important point and a good place to end on just say a little bit more about that because you do oh. talk about that in the book uh well uh the hero's purpose is to be victorious in a particular quest. And after you succeed, what do you do then? Well, nowadays, it's, well, you go on to a bigger quest. Uh, you aim higher and you want more, a higher office, a bigger company. But again, it's like gravity and it starts to accumulate everything for no benefit, it ends up in a black hole. The trickster is kind of uh, the fifth energy, the, the mysterious dark energy that makes the universe expand. To use a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But part of the, the thing that needs to happen is the, the patriarch needs to get off the throne. Yes. Right. And I mean, look at America right now. Who's leading America is this doddering old man who's not fit for service. And uh, why do you think that is that people would rather have someone like Joe Biden in charge than a, a younger man or middle-aged man at this point? Uh, 
Well, we had a bad experience with the last one. Was yeah, but the, he was old too. I mean, he was past yes. his prime as well, right? Uh, well, uh, you could say that, well, maybe that's what we need now is the mentor wise teacher who doesn't try to get everything for himself anymore. Well, yeah, but, uh, you know, that's a tall order for American politics. I, you know, that would be a godsend. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> like Jimmy Carter is, uh, you know, he's the last one that I can think of who kind of filled that role. Um, well, uh, he was pretty saintly, uh, but like a lot of presidents have been really tricky, too. Um, well, Clinton did a lot of good for the economy, but he was a total trickster, right? Uh, yes, with the philandering, the trickster's qualities. Well, on the saxophone, he was a musician. Well, that's true. He was a, he was a charmer. Yes. Uh, Lyndon Johnson. Whoever, whoever thought you could trust a saxophonist? Come on. Like, of course, <laughs> of course he's going to get in trouble. He plays the saxophone. Come on. Uh, <laughs> well, well, thanks Alan, for having me. Yeah, it's been really fun. And... Um, you know, you're kind of an under the radar guy. You're there in San Francisco doing your thing. Um, I couldn't find a website for you or anything. I had to like call your office and, you know, try an old email or something. But so um, just uh, maybe I'll just point people to to pick up your books. Would that be the best thing? Sure. Yes. Uh, I actually do have a website, but it's probably no longer in search engines because I don't change it very often. <laughs> uh, I think it's storiesfortheages.net okay well i'll look it up and if if i get it right i'll put it in the description if people want to go there and okay. uh, blow yes. the dust off your old website <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for having me yeah 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 you're wonderful thanks so much alan talk sure. talk to you later bye bye okay. bye <laughs> hello, hello.